So at the, at the same time that Trump became president, Milo was doing a tour around universities, teaching people how to uh, take actions against immigrants or how to harass women. The, uh, the idea was uh, that if, if he could do this, he would create a new generation of like young fascists. And that if anybody tried to stop him from doing this, they could say, oh, the left is against free speech. So the, the last event, uh, the climax of, of, Trump, of, of uh, Milo's tour, was to happen in Berkeley, California, which is a, like a, a center of left and anarchist energy. That day, thousands of people came to protest against Milo's speech. And hundreds of police came and held those people back. Uh, and it looked like Milo would be able to speak. But then a, a black block of 100 people arrived. And this is important because this was immediately after the arrest that I talked about before. Um, because people didn't know if they were also going to be arrested and go to prison for a long time. The other thing that's interesting is that when the black bloc arrived, all of the other people there, including the liberals and leftists, like cheered. If you've ever been in a black bloc, I would be surprised if you had been cheered. But it, was a, it showed that there, had, uh, that there had been a moment in which militant organizing was legitimized. The Black Bloc marched to the front, uh, forced the police back, tore down the barricades, smashed out the windows of the building, built a giant fire, and uh, no one was arrested. The police ran away. Uh, the police were like with the megaphone saying, please, Milo won't speak. We surrender, just go home. <laughs> okay, it was a pretty good night. So. The, the thing that's interesting after this though, is that you know Milo had a two-sided program. He had a two-sided plan. And he had succeeded in a way in getting people to uh, act like they were against free speech. You know? So they, they used this to mobilize more right-wing people. And they kept bringing more and more fascists to Berkeley, California in one action after another. So every few weeks there was a, a giant like, physical fight between fascists and anarchists and other people. And really the, the fascists, they didn't need to win a victory. They, they were just trying to, to get a video that, that they could show that would be the same as the video of Richard Spencer being punched. They were basically trying to shoot an advertisement for young people to become violent fascists. And over the next months, we saw this, uh, this conflict take a, there's a phenomenon I'm going to call the pendulum effect. Every time one side won a victory, the other side would use that victory to mobilize more people who hadn't been taking action before. One of our ways of analyzing this was through social taboos. So there's a social taboo around against being a fascist, right? But there's also a social taboo protecting freedom of speech and a social taboo against violence. And the, the fascist idea was that if they could get us to violate taboos that were more socially important than the taboos they were violating, that they could use this to recruit more people. This is an important question for us to think about because maybe we don't believe in these taboos, but it was still a strategic question of how we relate to the, pop the rest of the population. What we were seeing at this time was the, the growth of a fascist movement, a hor like an autonomous fascist movement. The function of a, a street fascist movement is to, to narrow the possibilities of change. Because if we are always having a fight against fascists who are outside the state, it makes it hard for us to focus on fighting against the state and against the actual forms of capitalism that oppress us. And if the fascists can keep us in a reactive position, then it's hard for us to propose the, the changes that we want to. And then it seems that the, the right-wing people are the only ones who are actually proposing a, a change. This is the, the, the like risk for us. If we, if we are forced to only be trying to stop them, then they can say they're the ones who actually have an idea for what to do about capitalism. And in the confrontations with fascists, the police will protect the fascists if there's only a few fascists. But when there are a lot of fascists, the police are, are nowhere at all. Okay, so this, uh, this escalating conflict went on for many months in many different parts of the country and reached a, uh, a climax in the town of Charlottesville, not very far from where I live. The, um, the far right, well, the fascists and Nazis uh, organized an event there that would bring together all of the different right wing groups. And the idea was to legitimize far-right organizing as a, as a new political force in the United States. 
And in fact, uh, the, the liberals, the leftists who were against Trump were not thinking about what the fascists were doing. So it was only a few hundred anarchists and anti-racists that went to Charlottesville to fight alongside the black people and poor people from Charlottesville against a thousand Nazis in this like small town. And it was worse than this actually, because in the discussions the night before, uh, anarchists were afraid that if they fought in, uh, with their faces covered, that this would make them look uh, like something threatening or something strange and it would help the fascists to do more recruiting. So on the day of the fight, um, it was a bunch of anti-fascists and anarchists with their faces bare and uh, in front of all the cameras so that the fascists can find out who everyone is and find their home and threaten them. This was, a, this was another moment when people were really brave, I think, uh, because um, even though there were, there were more fascists and the fascists had more weapons, the, they were still able to create such a chaos in the streets of Charlottesville that finally the uh, manifestation of the fascists was impossible. Uh, in revenge for this, one of the fascists uh, got in a car and drove the car into a crowd of anarchists and anti-fascists. Uh, seriously injuring two dozen people and killing one person, which is, was a tragedy, right? But it, and, and in fact, many people had already been killed by fascists around the United States when this happened. May, mostly like poor people, queer people, people of color. But the, uh, the fact that it was a middle class white woman who was killed finally got the attention of the leftists and liberals. So the, the next fascist demonstrations after this, suddenly everybody was an anti-fascist. And thousands of people came out and, and prevented fascists from getting organized. This, this created new problems where like politicians and left people who were in local government were saying, the anti-fascists are a gang, the, you know, we have to get them under control. And it also created the problem that uh, Anarchists have spent so much attention focusing on fascists that we, we just look like violent Democrats, basically. It makes it harder to e express what the political difference is between us and Democrats, between us and state communists, authoritarian communists. But these victories did give us a little bit of space to breathe. You know? I think basically we had gotten distracted from fighting the state, but we did succeed in stopping the growth of fascism. Now I, I want to go back to the, uh, to the court case for all the people arrested on the first day that Trump was president. They were trying to create a, a new legal example where they would say everyone in a black block is a criminal who should spend years in prison. So if you are at a, at a demonstration wearing black, even if it's just because you're a goth who listens to The Cure, <laughs> yeah, then, then you can go to prison, which is... Uh, well, music aside, it's a you know, problem. We want to encourage the Cure fans to be political. The, the court case, the, the strategy for the court case, people put a lot of energy into solidarity for the, the defendants. And I think this kind of organizing is at least as important as, as fighting the police in the streets. Not just the like legal defense, but also taking care of people emotionally and organizing logistical support, like getting people from all around the United States to, to Washington, D.C. over and over to the court. The court strategy that uh, people agreed on was that all of the defendants, who, who didn't know each other at all before this, would agree not to cooperate with the state at all. The understanding that some of the people who were defendants had, were there by accident, you know, who didn't like anarchists, you know, and other people uh, were there because they had broken a lot of things and punched police. And the, the state was trying to make distinctions between people to, to say, you know, okay, we have video of you punching a cop, like you should, you should make an agreement with us and just do a few years in prison. Mm -hmm. But through a lot of arguing, almost everyone was convinced in the end that they would be in the best situation if nobody would cooperate at all. And the people who volunteered to, to try to get the, for, the first court cases, a strategy to make sure that the people who had the least evidence against them would go to court first and say, I'm just a Cure fan, you know, this is like <laughs> uh, yeah, political repression of, of like, depressed people. But in, in, fact, uh, in fact, everyone was declared innocent. This is still a bad situation because the people that the state had the most evidence against were, were the only ones left. But the, the publicity around the case was so bad 
and people kept doing solidarity actions uh, about this. And of course, the, you know, the judges and the prosecutors are corrupt. If you look close enough, you find something. That finally it became too much trouble and they dropped the charges against everyone. Yeah, a, a, a major victory, although it took a year and a half. I'm getting close to the end of my, my story now. I, I want to say the, uh, you know, so I've described some victories that we achieved, actually. But there are also things that we failed to do, and, and these are the most important things to talk about. Because we were so busy fighting against Trump and against the fascists, against the police, that we didn't do everything that we could have to show how our alternative is different from the alternatives proposed by the liberals and the left. After we succeeded in dividing the ruling class, the, the problem is that there were then uh, left and liberal uh, proposals for what to do about Trump. So for example, the FBI was investigating Trump. And all of these nice Democrats who had been in the streets with us at the beginning started to stay home and like things on Facebook again. And they, they created this strange millenarian cult where this, uh, where this person from the FBI was going to be like the, the Christ that comes to rescue everyone from Trump. You know? and from my perspective, this, this, is, this shows how stupid the, the like liberals are. Not only because the FBI person that they were all worshipping was the same one that carried out all the repression against the anarchists before this, but also, as everyone knows, the only way to have a coup or a, like a pseudo-coup inside of the government is if you have a lot of chaos in the streets. You know, so they, they would have had to be in the streets still for it, for it to work. When, in the end, when the FBI person, when Mueller presented his report, the streets were empty and so nothing happened. They're like, okay, yeah, Trump, whatever. You know. Repression has actually not been very strong under Trump after the J-20 arrests because they, they've been so busy fighting each other, they haven't had time for us. I think that the greatest threat is actually that some centrist or left government will come to power and then the, the FBI will have the legitimacy to attack us with a free hand. So the, the problem we see today in the United States is that people are not in the streets as much, that things have become more normalized now, partly because we have been so busy fighting fascists that in, in place of the like radical street-based social movements that we need, okay, there, are, there are more anarchists now, yeah? There are more. But also, uh, there are a lot more people joining left parties and the left parties promise to do everything for them. And on the left, we, we also see a, a new desire for authoritarianism, for like a left Trump. Because as people like lose power over their lives, they, they want an authoritarian figure to get revenge on their behalf. The challenge for us now is to show that change can only come from self-organization, not from elections. And to continue to, to hold on to the, the, the gains that we've made through this period of, of, uh, of fighting, through, the, through this period of like, struggle, in the new situation ahead when we will be against some other kind of government. So uh, there, in a, in a short period of time, is a lot of different struggles in a country of many millions of people.